Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from interest.co.nz and welcome to another Double Shot interview. This is where we bring in a minister or a chief executive and over a cup of coffee ask them a few questions for about 10 minutes or so. And here we have Sandy Mayer, the chief executive of South Canterbury Finance, here again. We've spoken to Sandy before and I'll put a link on this blog post to our previous interviews. But since then there's been quite a bit of action around South Canterbury Finance. In particular, uh, Standard & Poor's have downgraded South Canterbury Finance uh, again. Uh, Sandy, what was the story there? Why have they downgraded you? I think it basically boils down to liquidity, if I had to think of one thing. And um, it, it was not uh, totally unexpected, unfortunately, and it's, it's in the air for most finance companies. You know, what, what will the support be for a, a guaranteed or unguaranteed finance company going forward? Nobody's got any reference points. Um, Standard & Poor has pretty elaborate metrics that uh, they link companies into their database and they had said for some time that they expected us to reach a certain set of hurdles and we said, well, we're working on it, but we obviously didn't get there to their satisfaction. Um, it always seems sort of gratuitous to criticize your rating agencies, um, but the reality of it is that we're working to a timetable that suits us and is practical and feasible. and. Um, I guess we'll just have to get there and then turn around and see if they'll upgrade us as quickly as they downgrade us. So they downgraded you from double B to single B. Under the rules of the extended guarantee scheme, you were into the scheme with the double B rating, but you stay in the scheme even though you've dropped under that double B threshold. Correct. There, there's no direct linkage between the post-entry numerical grade, uh, alphabetic grade, and staying in. Now, theoretically, I guess, you know, it's always ministerial and treasury discretion under the deed to, to toss you out and, and terminate. Now, that would mean that everybody who's in the guarantee stays. But there's, there's no sign of any of that. Um, it makes sense that people will look to the fundamentals of this. And, and uh, I think that um, government has uh, a useful double check at points in the process through the rate agencies. But once you're in, you're in. Uh, and I think it would take a very severe deterioration of the underlying aspects of things. So we, we need to really look at the fundamentals, not at the, the headline grade. Now, uh, on the same day, Alan Hubbard, the uh, owner of Southbury Holdings, which owns South Canterbury Finance, announced that he would, uh, at a time in the future, step down from the chairmanship of the South Canterbury Board and also step down as a director but remain as president for life. What does that mean for his involvement in South Canterbury? Well, first of all, uh, it was pretty coincidental that uh, both things had been ongoing for a while. Obviously, we don't control the pace of the rating agencies, and when these events happen under continuous closure, they have to be released to the market. So they both ended up on the same day, and uh, that, that kind of overloaded media, I think, a bit. Um, Alan had announced at last year's AGM that he intended to step down in the course of the year, uh, so that was uh, pretty much non-news and was treated as non-news. It really has to do with the succession. Um, Alan is, after all, 80-plus, uh, and while he is hard at work every day, um, it, we really needed to signal to the market that the, the independent board, uh, which was dominantly independent, now is totally independent, uh, were the guys who were running the show, and that there was a plan and that there was a succession plan. Uh, if there are further directors appointed and when a chair is appointed, that too will be announced. So, uh, you know, at least one of those things is sort of in the offing. Uh, the other important thing about it was that um, South Canterbury faces two, in my view, two principal tasks. One is to get through this liquidity period and get on a firm footing there. And Alan is pivotal to that. Alan has been the face of the company for a long time. Alan has relationships and linkages with a lot of our depositors, and they wish to see him there and involved. So he's remaining in that role of helping with the liquidity, and I would expect that as we do road shows, he might make an appearance and talk a little bit about uh, his continuing presence in that area. And then really importantly, um, we have said for some time that we're on the search for a significant amount of equity. And really what that means is Alan selling down the 100% ownership through the parent company. And so when that happens, that's an Allen decision. So he's got to be very, very involved in that. And we really asked Allen to step away from the day-to-day, -day, 
get the succession plan going, hand over to others in terms of the routine stuff, and focus on the two big issues of liquidity and finding an investor. So Alan Hubbard and Southbury could sell its 100% stake in South Canterbury Finance? Well, Alan could sell at any point in time. That's his decision, not, not ours, not mine. He's the shareholder. And um, the, the Is he looking to sell that? Well, you know, it's been announced for a while that that's a possibility. Now, uh, you know, th th our sense has been that that uh, is the logical next step, is to get a good underpinning of new capital. and. Uh, the market has speculated widely on that being something that's desired, and I think Alan is absorbing that message and is focusing on it. So I've got nothing to announce today, but you know that that process is underway and has been for some time. Uh, and by the way, just uh, uh, Alan, uh, just to, to make sure we, we get the picture, Alan has in fact stepped down as a director in his chair already. That that took place last Friday, so Alan, right. Alan has stepped away, and the board is being run by the three independents at the moment. Okay. And um, does that mean then that he's no longer involved in the, I call the day-to-day -day business? Because when we spoke last time, he was opening letters and he was doing stuff. Well, I mean, not, not involved in the day-to-day. -day. I mean, Alan, as shareholder, still carries on a pretty vigorous correspondence, and he is in seven days a week. But he's primarily devoted himself to the strategic tasks and taken less interest. And uh, not being a director, he doesn't get involved in signing documents and working through individual loans and all of that. So. It's a pretty substantial refocusing of his energy towards the two big problems um, at South Canterbury, and he's also still on the boards of some of our operating subsidiaries where he's been for years, and, and he's retained that for the moment. Now, uh, one of the issues is the injection of equity, which people have asked for, and which um, was on the cards, at least into Southbury, um, before the announcement a week or so ago from Torchlight. Now, Torchlight is owned by Pine Gould Corporation, uh, involves George Kerr, the major shareholder in Pine Gould Corporation, and the original plan was for Torchlight to put some equity into Southbury. Now, the announcement last week was that instead Torchlight would lend some money directly to South Canterbury into that, um, that uh, first position in the, uh, the ranking of, of creditors. Can you give us more detail about what's gone on there? Well, the, the transactions that have been done with Torchlight have always had a hybrid nature. They have had characteristics of equity for accounting purposes, and they've had characteristics of debt for security purposes. And that's been pointed out by the media sometimes quite critically, perhaps fairly, perhaps unfairly. And uh, we've gotten to the stage where all of these transactions require uh, really a set of high hurdles from Treasury under the extended guarantee, from the trustee under the deed, from our own board in terms of what makes sense. And last week, in consultation with George, for a range of reasons, uh, we decided that this transaction was probably best done in its simplest fashion. Um, its simplest fashion was to call it debt and secure it as debt. Uh, the trustee was accommodating in terms of saying, let's do that. The cash is cash to you. The effects on liquidity are the same. Uh, go away and focus on raising a large piece of equity, which is really the solution. And that comes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. So basically, we rejigged the transaction to be very simple, plain vanilla senior debt, and we now have the task very clearly outlined uh, in consultation with Treasury, the trustee, and our own board of going out and getting the equity. Now, Torchlight is uh, first in line if there's any um, carve up in the assets, mm -hmm. and uh, that first in line position, how much uh, of the asset base now is, is Torchlight in that first, first position? Well, there's, uh, it bounces around from day to day, but uh, we're allowed to have a first ranking position ahead of debenture holders and others of 7.5% of assets, roughly speaking, uh, and that gives us about 130, 40 million on, on a given day, depending on what's in motion. Um, so it could actually be a little more. It's a fixed amount, it doesn't balloon out, nobody is doing anything that's uh, unusual. So Torchlight's 100 million is a significant fraction of what's available in that first charge. How much more could you use that first charge to bring in cash to 